graduated from the University of Mexico and then came to Rochester to work at RIT as an interpreter for several years. He wanted to continue his education and decided to go to the University of Texas at Austin and received his PhD last year. I feel a little bit like he's my academic nephew and I'm his aunt. Why would that be? Well, I wrote a letter of recommendation to graduate school for him, and I sat on his committee for his dissertation. If I had been chairperson of the committee, I might be his academic mother, but since I was just on the committee, I feel like I'm his aunt. He works nearby at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Lesser Taught Languages. And he's going to be speaking about language contact. So I'd like to introduce David Kintor Pozos. Thank you, Aunt Susan. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to be here. It's been six years since I've been away. I left in 1996, and I think, wow, I said goodbye to Rochester, and then I came to Texas where it's warm and fabulous, and it was terrific. It was such a nice change. And I think, wow, the summertime there is so hot. I think, whew, maybe it's a little too warm for me, but I'm still saying goodbye to Rochester. I have friends that I like to keep in touch with, but now that I'm here back east, and living in Pittsburgh, it's so much closer to Rochester. I'm able to see my friends much more often, so that's been wonderful. And to be here at NTID is just a great experience for me. The topic I'd like to speak about today is language contact. S language contact means when two languages are in proximity of each other, how they play with how they play with each other in their changes in grammatical and syntax. I'm sure some of you know that Clayton Valley, unfortunately, passed away, I believe it was Sunday or Monday of this week, which is a very sad occasion for us. Clayton Valley was one of the first pioneers of research between language con for language contact. Clayton worked with Seal Lucas, and the two of them investigated the contact in, and between ASL and English, and how they overlap each other in different ways. But that was the very first work done in that area. Because I'm interested in that topic, I thought that I wanted to modify it. My interest was in Mexican Sign Language and American Sign Language, and how the two of them interplay with each other when they're in contact. I will be talking today about various types of contact between the languages, and how it is shown linguistically. I will point out various similarities and different ways that that contact between the two languages can appear. sign language, I'm going to be signing L-S-M. As you can see from the slide, I would like to explain how and why people are using that here in the United States. So you would think, in the United States, we use ASL, why are we concerned about L-S-M? The reason is because some deaf people have moved here from Mexico, and that's the primary language that they come with. In the southwest area, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, we see quite a few deaf Mexicans living in large cities. People Im immigrate, immigrate to the United States, and perhaps they're working in the United States, and they cross back to the border of Mexico where they live. They're very, sometimes they come for their children, so they be able to have an education. Sometimes they come into the United States to be able to shop groceries, but 
with whom as many Mexicans are in the United States in those regions. And when they are here, what language do they use? LSQ or LSM or American Sign Language? We do have many interpreters in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, the Southwest region. If, for example, someone were to go to school and they needed an interpreter for meetings, like an IEP meeting, then they would come to the meeting and there would be an interpreter provided. You would have the deaf child, the mother, the principal, and the mother wouldn't be able to speak English, she would be speaking Spanish. The principal might possibly be speaking English, but switching back and forth between Spanish and English. Then we have the deaf child who signs ASL, and between that you have a three language communication fiasco. The deaf student generally has spent time in Mexico with Mexican children who also know LSM, and so they have a mixture of LSM and ASL in their language base. So my point in explaining all this is that LSM is used quite often in the United States in the Southwest regions and also in other areas of the country. There are many different advocacy programs for deaf people in those areas, teaching them life skills, independent living skills. We know that deaf people from Mexico are here in the United States and they're trying to get services for them. Several years ago, you might have heard the story about people who were exploited from Mexico who happened to be deaf. They told people that they needed help, and they gathered up a group of people from Mexico. They put them all in one situation and had a particular man, a, a man had asked them to come help them, and when he got them there, he basically enslaved them and asked them to work for him in, in a non-voluntary way. This has happened in Chicago and South Carolina, so it does happen in the Southwest, but it also happens in the North, in the East, and in the West of our entire country. So deaf Mexicans have come to many different places to find themselves in these situations. So LSM users are now more widely spread throughout the United States in various regions. My specific research I wrote my dissertation in describing the linguistic phenomena that results from contact between LSM and ASL, as you can see here on the screen. Now when I talk about the influences from contact, what would that be? Spoken language contact for example, between Spanish and English has a different characteristics that you can outline. And with sign language, ASL and LSM, there is contact. And the question is, are those crossovers have the same characteristics or are they different between the verbal and the manual language? Just as a point of interest, in 1800s, French Sign Language really came across the world to help mold other sign languages. For example, we know that Laurent, Laurent Clerc came here with Gallaudet to help build American Sign Language. And we also know now that French Sign Language had an impact on Mexican Sign Language as well. The history of Mexican Sign Language and American Sign Language is quite similar. Not by the same particular man, Laurent Clerc, but another man named Eduardo Hewitt. He was from Brazil, and he came to, the he worked at the schools for the deaf in Brazil and established a system of education and language. Then he came to Mexico City in about 1866 to share what he had learned. French language then went from French Sign Language on one side 
became American Sign Language, as it did with Clark and Gallaudet, and with him in Mexico, it turned into LSM. So the development of French and American Sign Language were parallel. So the topic of content contact between languages is something that you can discuss for hours. It includes social interaction, cultural norms, the backgrounds that people bring, and a variety of other elements. From this list, I've decided to talk about two particular features, one being structural, stru structural and the other being lexical. Lexical means the words, the specific words they use. So we're talking about how the signs themselves are different and how the structure of the two languages are different. First of all, I'd like to address the structural differences. Phonologically, a phonological parameter that you see up here on the screen means hand shape of sign. It means the movement of the sign, the placement of the sign, the place of articulation. Also, I can focus on syntax. It's possible that that would be involved, but generally it is, it is emphasis. The emphasis is on the phonological characteristics. The next category is lexical, which means the sign itself. So we all know that ASL is a language, and we know that LSM is, an, is a language. Are they completely different, though, is the question, or are there some overlaps between the two? Is there a sign in one language that is so similar that it could be the same sign in another language? And we have discovered that between 20 to 30 percent of the vocabulary has similar characteristics that they share. For example, here's the sign for enjoy in American Sign Language. In Mexican Sign Language, it's the same sign, only letter cued with the letter well, we would see it as an L, but in Mexican Sign Language, it's the sign for G. I'm sure you're well aware of these three characteristics of the parameters of sign formation. The majors are phonological. The major phonological parameters are hand shape, place of articulation, and movement. We also have minor characteristics. This is from 1979, from Klima and Belugi, two researchers from California who went to the Salk Institute and did lots of research and studies. They really focused on the three major and the three minor categories of parameter. One example of a minor parameter would be the palm orientation, which way the palm is facing when the sign is produced. This too, for the example of enjoy, both in LSM and ASL, means relates to the hand shape and also whether or not you use two hands or one hand. But the movement is the same, the location is the same. So the question is, does it adhere to the system? And it would be called sim similarly articulated sign because almost all the parameters are the same. So that would be an example of the 20 to 30 percent of the shared signs that I just spoke of. So whether I use it, and if the movement was different, then it would not have been called a similar similarly articulated sign. But because it adheres to the major parameters, it is included in that group. So there needs to be at least two parameters for it to fit in the major category. The locations for data collection were near the Texas border. One was El Paso, Texas, and the other area is called the Texas Valley. Really, it's the Rio Grande Valley, but most people just call it the valley now. There were several towns involved in this portion of the study. 
I don't know if you are aware of this, if you've been there or not, but if you haven't, this is what we're talking about. That's where El Paso is located. Juarez is located directly below El Paso. Juarez has a very, very big deaf population. So Juarez and, and El Paso are very, very close to each other. So there's quite a condensed population there. This is the valley that I was just mentioning. It is quite a distance from El Paso. It's about a 10 hour drive by car from the valley up to El Paso. So it's quite a jaunt. Texas, recall, is a huge state, just like California. It's quite a distance from one end to the other. So those were our two test sites to collect our research information. The people involved in the research study were all deaf participants. There were four in each area for a total of eight. Of the four in each area, we decided to have the same requirements for, for each. We had people who were bilingual. Two of them were bilingual and could swallow code switch back and forth. One was born in Mexico, grew up in Mexico, moved to the United States. Another was born here in the United States, grew up in the United States, but went to Mexico quite frequently and was able to learn and make friends and associate with Mexican people and is a very, very strong LSM user. So those two people were bilingual. The next person involved was a completely dominant LSM user and the fourth was a completely dominant ASL user. And the reason I did this was because I wanted to know how everyday communication would look. If everyone was completely bilingual, we wouldn't have an, an accurate example or representation because if everyone can code switch, then you aren't going to see where the similarities and differences lie in the language basis. Let me explain the research process. We had one-on-one -on -one interviews Keep in mind that there were the two deaf bilingual people. As I said, the how the four people in El Paso and their strengths and their requirements were the same as the people in the valley. The bilingual people would conduct the interview. We'd have four people in the room and they would be talking about a variety of different topics. The one one-on-one -on -one interview, well, for example, let me start by saying this way. An interviewer would say, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Are you from here? Are you from Mexico? Give a variety of questions that were background related to the deaf person, and the deaf person would answer. At that point, we would have the four in the room and discuss some trivial topic, like for example, in Mexico, they talk about eating tortillas. But the tortillas can either be corn or flour. Now, at least that was my experience growing up. I generally ate flour. Other people had different experiences. Did you eat corn? Did you eat flour? So that was the kind of things that they would dis discuss. Another question they might chat about was, again, what do you prefer, corn or tortilla? Oh, I really like corn because... Blah. So we, what we try and do is elicit feedback from the people about questions that they knew absolutely everything about. You didn't want to ask a question where they would say, hmm, I don't know. You wanted to elicit information. So to do that, you need to talk about something that they're very familiar with. So people would get talking about how their mothers cooked different things, which one was better than the other. So it was a great natural communication that was occurring with the four people. The 
This is how the room was set up. The thing in the corner you can see is the video camera. You can see it looks like a triangular or a, a four-sided four shaped object. Then I, the researcher, would be sitting back in the corner and maybe feed some information or some questions to somebody. And sometimes I would say, for example, ask about where they grew up. The interviewer would say, you grew up where? And then they'd start the conversation again. But the deaf person changed my question lexically so it was consistent with the languages used in the group. And sometimes they would turn to me and say, are you ready for the next question? And we'd check back with each other. And then the interviewer would start again with the questioning of the group. So basically what I did was just paste the question. After we videotaped these sessions, we collected all the data, and then we went back to Austin, Texas, and tried to code all of the sign usage we saw in the videotape. At first, when I began looking at the videotapes, I decided I needed to establish categories for various things. Obviously, the first thing would be signs. For example, back to the sign, enjoy. That was something that I recognized quite quickly as an ASL sign. Or this sign, which looks like tree, or the sign that looks like mother, or the sign that looks like father. Those are all signs that are distinct that I put into a category. The next category was fingerspelling, which follows logically after that, and the next being classifiers. For example, if a person was talking about a man and they used the one index hand shape, that would be a classifier. And the thing is, you just try and find out, is it a classifier based on ASL or LSM? But I decided to group all of those types of movements into classifiers. The next is pointing movements for anything, any language. People point to point to a person as a pronoun, or they point to a place as an absent referent. For example, the stool is over there or in the corner over there, and then it's held in space. The next is gestures. Gestures was a really interesting category that I'd like to get into a little bit later, but I had a time, difficult time, trying to figure out if something was actually a gesture or a sign, and that's something I'll discuss more in a minute. Unsurement, I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> person serve as a coder and we worked together in going through each of the items so we'd refer to each other when we weren't sure what it was. I had 6,477 elements to study. And this is the graph of the result. A large portion are the signs, whether it be ASL or LSM, or sometimes we would have similar, similarly articulated signs that we would put in it. Like I said, the sign for enjoy and the sign that's similar to that in LSM. Also, pointing is quite a large category. was a smaller unit. Gestures was a little bit of a bigger unit. But obviously, pointing and signs were the major breakdowns. I'd like to take a minute and discuss my findings. And one of the things I'd like to talk about is interference. There are different types of interference, one being phonological and the other using non-manual signals, NMS, which means a raised eyebrow or lowered eyebrows, body shifts, or the head being tilted back or forward. I'll get into that in just a moment. The next part would be lexical differences the signs themselves being completely distinct. 
for example, the ASL sign for family. And the Mexican sign is family, which are very distinct differences in the signs. So that would be an example of lexical differences. You can also see that deaf people, of course, code switch back and forth between L's and so. When it comes to numbers, LSM and ASL are very different. And I'll give you examples of these as we go through it. And I can go through and show you the differences. Deaf people sometimes use a special way of indicating numbers. The heast is a language linguist who has written about interference, and this is a clip, uh, a um, excerpt from his work. If a person, for example, grew up speaking only English, and another person grew up speaking another language, and the person speaking English decided they wanted to learn a secondary language, and they took a course in it, like, for example, French. So they would struggle trying to learn the French pronunciation of words, and eventually they would probably do relatively well. But the English, because it was something you were a native speaker of, of course interfered with their production of the French language. So the syntax and the structure might be interfered with along with the phonological interference. So I'm back to the lexical portion, meaning the interference can be the word or the sign that would interfere. Let me give you an example of interference related to sound-based languages. English language, we have T. The sound T, like table, travel, tree, and the like. The sound T, a letter. In Slavic languages, for example, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian. Those Slavic languages also have the T sound in their language, but the sound of, their t of the T is slightly different. If I was talking about, if I was trying to explain this, I would show you where their tongue and their teeth go to produce the letter. In Slavic languages, the back of the tongue rests on the teeth, in English, it, it's on the alveolar ridge. The tongue rests on the alveolar ridge to make the T sound. So they're both saying T, but the sounds are slightly different because of the placement of the tongue. So if I'm speaking English and I go to a Slavic country, for example, Russia, and I try to learn Russian, I might have a difficult time pronouncing the T sound because although it's generally the same, the production is going to be different, and so therefore that sound will interfere with my pr production of the word. So phonological interferences, for example, hand shape. Everyone knows the sign for F in ASL, which is this. This is the sign for S and LSM. Obviously, you can see the French roots in both languages. ASL modified. Stuck. LSM stuck with the original French hand shape, which you can see produced here but English or American Sign Language is modified to make the thumb go to the end of the finger. Again, the ASL sign for family. Some deaf people say family, but they have the F hand shape in LSM, even though they're using the American sign. Some deaf people say family using the LSM sign, but the hand shape is an ASL hand shape, so you see interferences there. 
And that's an example where the hand shape is the primary focus of the interference. Finger spelling, for example, of the deaf person finger spells there, <coughs> F-A-I-R. Sometimes they use the LSM F and then continue to spell in American I-A-R. A person might have grown up in Mexico and they have that native, that natural instinct to use the F hand shape as they were used to in Mexico as opposed to modifying it in American Sign Language. Phonological interferences are in the place of articulation. Like, for example, in ASL, the sign for light is produced like this. LSM, this is the sign with this hand shape. That's the L hand shape. A deaf person signed one time this. So, AS, does ASL ever use the lips? We use the chin, we use maybe the nose, but your place of articulation in ASL is never on the lips. But in LSM, it is grammatically correct. So I've seen those type of interf errors or interference. The next example is with palm orientation. You've heard the sentence, mind your P's and Q's, meaning watch out, you have to pay attention, you have to do everything the right way. I kind of modified it. <laughs> mind your P's and K's. <laughs> In American Sign Language, you're familiar with the letter P and the letter K. In LSM, the letter P is produced like this, which is the same as our letter K, and the sign for K starts with the hand shape, with the palm orientation down, and then moves it facing front. So K and P are actually the same sign, but they hold different meanings. An example for this would be the word pen. This is how you would spell it. Like a pen. But they sign P in the LSM form and then EN from American Sign Language. And of course you understand it from context, but if you don't have that, it looks like Ken. Like the Ken doll, or what is it you're talking about? Which sounds silly, but it's true, because the K and the P come from different language pieces. And that's an example of the interference or the contact between the two languages. If you were talking about WH questions, yes, no questions, topic, comment, or for a variety of reasons, we use non-manual signals. If you were to pay close attention to a person's mouth, you will find the adverbial form and the adjective form. LSM, if you were to ask a WH question, would be different than you would expect in ASL. In ASL, you have furrowed brows that go down. In LSM, your neck goes back and your head moves back. Like como, for example, means how. In LSM, you sign it this way. Como. Qu 
Cuando means when. Cuando. That's how you sign it. In American Sign Language, we have the opposite. Your head comes forward and your brows are furrowed. It is interesting to see how some deaf people use signs that are mixed, like they use the non-manual signals from ASL with a with a Mexican sign. I can't do it the other way. I have no idea. I'm trying to do it. It's not working. It's tough. Um, wait. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. Head back out there. That's the LSN non-manual with the ink with the American sign, which is really tough for me to do. I can't do it this way. It's very interesting to see this mixture of the two languages being used. You can obviously see the non-manual signals, but you can also see they get pretty adept at using mixing the two languages. There's another example of mouthing within the sign language. There are different types of mouth movements. For example, if I sign an English sentence, I would say, hello, my name is David Quinto Pozos, and I am going to school, blah, 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 blah. So you can read that on my mouth. Some signs have their own non-manual mouth movements that are attached to the sign, for example. Um, if you say, you, know, you don't say the word have completely, you say v with your mouth, or you say v finish. If there's different have, the word the non-manual movement for have is attached to the sign. So ASL users are used to this and LSM users have their own way of doing that. The sign for LSM is produced like this, but they still use sometimes the non-manual signal from English. The mouthing is borrowed from, sign from American Sign Language. So they combine the LSM sign with the non-manual mouth movement of English, of American Sign Language. see the same idea um, with American Sign Language. You see the word that means equal, equal or the same. And so you'll see same on the mouth with this sign that means equal or same. Wait a minute. Again, I'm kind of... Okay. So you'll see the sign for same, but the mouth movement from sp the Spanish word, equal. So the sign will be the American Sign Language, same. The mouth movement is the Spanish, equal. So this is an example of interference between the two languages. Now, I can give you a lot of examples of phonological differences and influences, but now I'd like to talk about some lexical differences and influences. Some deaf in the group code switched between ASL and LSM fluently. Um, the people who knew ASL tended to stay with ASL, but some would code switch In the one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, if the interviewers um, signed 
LSM and seemed to depend on that totally. Uh, when that person got into the group, we would notice them doing a lot of code switching. So code switching happened for a variety of reasons. A person who had strong LSM in communicating with a strong bilingual uh, would find themselves code switching to match uh, what the bilingual person was doing. And they would use uh, possibly an ASL sign uh, to back up the LSM sign they were using. Also, related to lexical items, remember we were talking about numbers and how different they are. In LSM, these are the numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I'm sorry, that was ASL and LSM, one, two, three, four, five. Pretty similar uh, up until five. In ASL, six, LSM, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm trying to pat my head and <laughs> rub my belly at the same time. Fifteen. Fifteen. Um, Fifteen is two-handed in LSM. Sixteen in ASL in LSM. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. And twenty. Notice they're kind of similar, but a little different <laughs> between the two languages, the number 20. But in total, they're quite different. So deaf people struggled with this, these two very different number systems. It seems that they developed different strategies to make themselves clear, like... Uh, For the number 16, for example, they would do one, six. So they would do two separate numbers for 16, one, six, instead of 16. So that was one strategy that was developed. It was really hard for them to communicate numbers to one another. Or sometimes, when they were given the number in LSM, then they would back it up with the same number in ASL to make it clear. It was really hard, though, when they were trying to communicate numbers with one another, and they would use a variety of ways to make sure it was clear. Remember when we were categorizing things, the signing, the pointing, the classifiers? Well, one category of sign was signs, and I'd like to focus on the sign category right now. There were close to 4,000 signs that were used in the samples we collected, and that represented 62% of the data. What were the different types of signs that were used? In ASL, the sign for family, in A LSM, the sign for family, okay? They would use those signs, and they were totally different. Another category were similarly articulated signs, like the signs for enjoy. And the only difference was one phonological parameter. 
If there were two phonological parameters different, then they were considered totally different signs. Other signs look the same, but have different meanings. For example, in ASL, this sign means English or England. That sign in SML means amigo or friend. It's the exact same form, but very different meaning. SASU means same form, but different meaning. Some signs had the same form, but the meaning was close. For example, this sign in ASL means not. In LSM, that sign, same sign means nada, which is nothing. So the meanings were similar, but not exactly the same. I mean, the example I gave before of English and friend, they were exactly the same sign, but had very different meanings. Here we're talking about the same sign that has a similar but different meaning. If a deaf person used an SASU, it seemed as though the group, all of the different language users, would understand it. But one time that didn't happen. Uh, the discussion was, oh, I think it was during a one-on-one -on -one interview. And the question was asked, where did you learn English? And the response was, I learned English over there. And so it was actually that he had learned English from his friend, you know. And so it was really hard to figure out what they meant. But most of the time, uh, they were able to communicate with each other without much trouble. Sometimes we had to clarify and ask a person what they meant. Do you mean this? And then get a response from them. Okay, uh, now I'm finished talking about the various categories of signs and want to talk about another interesting factor. <coughs> As we looked at all of the data, the pointing, the signs, the gestures, now we had to determine what we meant by gestures. Here in the U.S., as people speak, they tend to use gestures. This thumbs up sign is a gesture. It has meaning. I mean, hearing people use it, everyone uses it. It has a set meaning. And people generally know what that means. And we use it in sign language, too. Or like this F hand shape, we use it. So now, do we classify that as a sign or a gesture? Is it a gesture that's become formalized and now is a sign? Well, we'll hold on to that for a minute. But there are a lot of gestures that people use, and they use repeatedly, like this thumbs up gesture, or like the come here gesture. So as we looked at this category of gestures and we looked at all of the data, um, I just discussed the similarly articulated signs. And now when we looked in Mexican Sign Language and American Sign Language, we saw that they both existed. But 
pointing. Mm, that was pretty clear. I mean, you're either talking about a person or a place. It was fairly clear. Gestures in the United States and Mexico, they were fairly clear to understand. When, just peop- when deaf people pantomimed something, it wouldn't matter if they grew up in Mexico or in the United States. They still seem to pantomime or gesture things in similar ways. And that represented about 50% of the data. Meaning less than 50% were signs that were different. Less than 50% of the signs were totally different. It didn't matter if they were strong LSM users or There were so many signs that are similarly articulated, pointed to, or gestured, that the communication was relatively clear 50% of the time. The other 50% were distinctly unique, different lexicon signs that were used in each language. So now I'd like to talk about the 20% of the total data, which was the similarly articulated signs. That's the thing. And that's the thing that's between 20 to 30, 35% that I mentioned earlier. And that's where LSM and ASL have some, some overlap. In the gesture category, it was 13% of the total data. The pointing category was 20%. So if you add all those up, it equals about 50%. So keep in mind that ASL and LSM are phonologically different. There are some phonological differences. Syntax aside, we aren't talking about syntax right now, but there are some varieties within the signs. But if you were to collect all that data and look at it, it seems as though the two languages have quite a lot of commonalities where you can understand each other between the two. discussions have been between spoken languages. And, for example, if we were to talk about spoken English and spoken Spanish, the contact area that they were studying would be the same. We would talk about the sound, the influences of the word choices, the borrowed uses of the, the borrowed words that would be in each spoken language, and the code switching that would occur. So everything that we've talked about today mirrors the studies that have been done in the past with spoken languages. Like, for example, in Montreal, they've studied French and English and the Creole and the contact between them. But one interesting point that we noticed is that there are things that look the same or things that deaf people will understand regardless of whether or not they grew up in the U.S. or Mexico. And those and those parts of the language equal about 50%. Now, to figure out more specifics would require a lot of research. For example, a gesture system. And all that that entails would require quite a bit to find out what it is about the gestures that both language users understand so easily. So the contact between signed languages mirrors the results with spoken languages with some unique differences. I would like to uh, thank the people who supported me with their grant, and thank you for your attention today.